Justin, welcome back. Yeah, good to see you. Um, I know we just uh, ran into each other at Apple a few weeks ago, but uh, yeah, how have you been? Yeah, great. I mean, that's actually the same with last episode. Matt was on. This is like, this is the follow up to WWDC where I got to like hang out with people in person and I missed that. So now I'm like trying to recreate it on the podcast. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been a while, but it seems like everything is coming back full fledged and the travel schedule is starting to get a little bit crazy again um, as we move towards the end of the year. So it was good yeah, to been, kind of kick it off with Apple and place. finally get a visit there. Well, yeah, any quick, uh, I mean, I talked about it with Matt a bit, but like any big highlights for you actually visiting Apple campus? It was your first time as well, I think? Yeah, it was. Uh, I feel like it's it's one of those things where growing up as a kid, um, when you join the tech industry and are creating videos about Apple and consumer tech, there are a few like key milestones that that you um, that you wish for, and some are more possible than others. But I feel like one of them was definitely to be able to get invited to an Apple event one day. And although it did take quite a while, uh, it was nice to finally be able to attend, and we kind of got that full experience there. Uh, Tim Cook stopped by. We got a quick tour of the facility. It was Apple's like Apple Park. It was also Apple's first event in quite a while. Um, a bit of that hybrid format of in person and online. We also got to go to the visitor center. Uh, have some food there and there's also a ton of fans uh, who watch the channel um, who work at Apple and so I mean I don't really get recognized that often in Victoria here and there maybe but I noticed at Apple it was just like the sense of community uh, it was very interesting to see in person yeah that was cool I, I found that too that a lot of the people just kind of like working there were saying hi and it, especially the Absolutely. people guiding us to our seats because there was a lot of um, sort of like bonus staff that I don't think necessarily are on campus all the time, but they were there to like usher people around and tell you what to do or where to go. And they they were very much the ones like, I love your channel because there was like, you know, they're all like into Apple. We're all there because we're, yeah. we're into these products. And um, yeah, I mean, I totally agree. And especially for you uh, and to add some context to anybody listening that doesn't already follow your channel, like you were showing that uh, WWDC was one of the videos you had posted about when you first started YouTubing, when you were just a baby. Uh, that was like 10 years <laughs> ago. Um, that's crazy. So yeah, what, what year was that, your first WWDC video? I think it was uh, 2010. I, I used to like make videos about anything back then. So uh, right. I would be following the news sites and whenever there'd be a breakthrough or like a date announced, uh, the video that I made 10 years ago exactly was uh, just talking about when WWDC was going to be or when it was predicted <laughs> right, to be. Yeah, yeah. And so it was uh, it was interesting to look back at those clips and just seeing back then it was just, it was almost impossible for a YouTuber to be invited to a YouTube event or to an Apple event. And so it's interesting to see how the industry has shifted, but also how I guess the channel, the quality and the progression has moved over the years. Yeah, I, I mean, I still remember clearly that it wasn't that long ago that it was a big deal just to see the biggest channels show up just to see Marquez yeah. be there was like, oh, that's like, even that was a surprise. Um, and I think I, I, I have a feeling that they were kind of ready. They've had this a little bit more open policy for a little while now. And I think COVID slowed down their ability to, to do it. But um, yeah, it's really great to see them kind of like recognizing who in the space is going to be able to spread the news about whatever they want to talk about in the most effective ways. And I think, you know, you and I obviously both cover this. So anybody not following Justin, you know, if you want uh, Mac news or especially your renovations are awesome, which <laughs> I'm doing renovations too, but I don't even, t I don't talk about them on the podcast. I've, but they're only on the Instagram account Dover underscore house, but I don't show them, but you like show off the whole thing and that's become like part I mean, of your gotta, bread and butter. Gotta on maximize too. it and you know, it's part of the company identity. And I mean, in the future, what I would like to cover more of is real estate. I think like long-term sustainability in the business and where I want to invest my money in, it's definitely like, get a lean towards real estate heavily. And so I actually enjoy documenting the process, but I'm sure like you've realized as well, it's a super long process that like internet doesn't show the behind the scenes of, all the, the pains and the delays, uh, cost exceeding and the, the drama that goes on in like the renovation and project and industry, it really isn't as smooth as, as things typically go. Um, and so every project you learn something, but you try to avoid the same mistakes in the next one, but then some other things start coming up. And so my current project is, is just like that. I mean, I thought it would take four months. The kitchen takes five, the drywall is not ready. The truck breaks down, which also happened in the last project. Um, they happened to want to deliver the kitchen the week that we're flying to the UK for a week. And we have a short deadline on that. And so I don't really like care about the project anymore. It seems like, but at the same time, we've only uploaded one episode on YouTube out of like the planned like 10. Uh, so 
it's it definitely goes in waves and then after you've done it you enjoy it for a little bit and it's like okay well time to go on to the next one uh, but during the process you're kind of thinking like i'm never going to do a renovation ever again i'd love to i think i'd live a much happier life if i didn't have to do one for a year um but yeah i mean it's it's something to look forward to at all times and a bit different from like the day-to-day -day of filming youtube and tech videos well, I think that's a bit of a difference between you and I is you definitely enjoy it. And for me, it's like, oh, I wish I was making YouTube videos. But, uh, but yeah, for me, I mean, you know, on my <laughs> side, like Anya's the one that loves it. So a lot of the time I'm helping fulfill her vision, which is kind of more of why I haven't done videos about it is because I'm like, well, I didn't decide on a lot of this decorating and uh, I'm just like along for the ride. So um, I don't know. I will I will cover it as the house is finished. And I'll definitely show the before yeah. and afters. But I didn't do the constant updates like because you're filming along the way and really documenting it. We're only really yeah, doing like it on archive. Instagram. We have a whole raid drive actually just for the renovation oh series, wow. and um, and so we archived all of them from like the last three years to just. I guess we always just pop in, film a little bit here and there. It's good that everything's very close for now because I mean, my dream for the next like few years is to build like a lake house investment property. But the problem is like if the lake house is 45 minutes away and trades like either doesn't show up or they're late, then you kind of ruin your day. And I think if anybody in the tech industry knows that alone is a full-time job and even beyond that, and especially when you add in like the travel series, the home series, um, in your case, like the podcast, it's very, very hard to, to be able to do everything at once. Yeah, or yeah, or do anything sometimes. I mean, because we're yeah. actually dealing with that right now. If we're renovating a place in Canmore, which is about an hour away. And so, yeah, we are already suffering through that needing to travel. But that actually, I mean, all of this is a good uh, segue into what we wanted to talk about. We were chatting a bit about it when we were in person. And, you know, we talk about it offline all the time. But it's, it's great timing to talk about the business of YouTube. Because you recently released a course about it. So perfect chance to let people know that it is out there. Um, so may maybe just first, if, if anybody enjoys this conversation, where should they go to find the, uh, the, the full course that you've done all about this? Yeah, so the course is uh, creatorcashflow.com and the whole tagline of it is, I guess, how to make your first million on YouTube. Um, but I think the, the real motive behind the story of talking about the business side of YouTube is, um, I mean, I started when I was about 12 years old making YouTube videos and from the very beginning of saving up for my first device, which was the iPod Touch, that alone was a two year process of just doing some small side tasks, um, selling stuff on Craigslist, and getting a commission from that, car washing. It was the very like traditional teenager way of being able to purchase my first resource, learning the industry, um, filming 300 videos in a year, borrowing stuff. And eventually as the channel kind of grew in size, expanded into like reviewing larger items from like smartphone cases to like iPhone. Um, and eventually also doing my first brand deal in like 2015. But because that industry has changed so much and because there's so much to learn in that space and it's definitely not been a quick process for me. It's taken about 10 years to be able to get to this point. And even though I'm very happy with where it's at now and where the business is at and how we have staff and a company and investments, uh, I feel like there are a lot of talented creators artistically um, that would love to learn more about the business side that can be applied a lot earlier um, and to be able to I guess not run into the same mistakes that I made when it came to like working with companies, businesses, contracts, MCNs and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we try to go into detail in this course through eight, eight hours of content where we talk about how to build the channel, some of the basic practices, um, maybe things that you should focus on more in the beginning and then eventually how to do your first brand deals, how to write emails, little strategy pieces of when the best timing is, but then eventually also how to build a company, hire your first members, what areas to delegate and also the big picture of like maybe some ideas of how to invest that capital and to continue to leverage the brand further beyond just that YouTube channel. Let's give a warm welcome to a brand new sponsor on the podcast. And they're a perfect fit here. It's Iodine. And they have the new All SSD Pro Data. It's the fastest storage solution for M1 Max. Conventional storage forces a trade-off between big, slow hard disks and small, fast SSDs. And without redundancy, your data isn't protected. Now, now with Pro Data, Iodine is delivering revolutionary storage for Pro desktops and workgroups. Pro Data is the first all SSD Thunderbolt RAID device that combines 12 NVMe SSDs and eight Thunderbolt ports in one single elegant device. It's incredibly powerful with storage performance up to five gigabytes per second. For the first time, multiple Thunderbolt connections can be combined 
to boost performance using iodine's breakthrough Thunderbolt NVMe multipathing. And all your digital assets are seamlessly protected with transactional RAID 6, checksum, and enterprise grade encryption. ProData features a sleek industrial design that fits just as well in a laptop bag as it does on a DIT cart or on your desk. It's shipping right now in 12 and 24 terabyte capacities. That's up to three times the size of the largest built-in Mac SSDs. And with the flexibility of Thunderbolt daisy chaining, many pro data services can be connected to a single Mac for nearly infinite expansion. Data even supports connecting up to four computers simultaneously and dividing its unique SSD storage pool into distinct containers with configurable passwords, encryption keys, RAID levels, and file system formats. Using Iodine's storage handoff technology, containers can be handed off in real time between collaborating Macs with just one click. So supercharge your setup for the fastest Thunderbolt storage for an M1 Mac and the fastest Thunderbolt RAID array Iodine Pro Data. To learn more, visit iodine.com. That's I O D Y N E dot com. I would spell it wrong too, so I'm going to do it one more time. I O D Y N E dot com. And thanks again to Iodine for supporting the show. I also think that there's just. I, I don't know if you covered, I haven't watched the course yet, right? So uh, I, I'm going into this blind and, and just trying to like learn from you. I think you're better than me at running a business. So I already have learned a lot from you just in our side conversations and stuff. But um, it's really, it's a specific skill that's not the same as creating the content. And there's there's absolutely people that are at a, like creatively more successful than let's say I am or have a bigger following, but are uh, also struggle more to build a business off of it and, and be able to be profitable and you don't need enormous numbers to run this as a business. You know, like I've heard Gary Vaynerchuk a million times refer to the idea that like not everybody needs to be an Oprah. It's like there's room for thousands of Sally, Jesse, Raphael's like that, like middle of the road, like you are making real money. This is your job and you can do it full time, but you don't need to worry about being the biggest star in the world to have it be, you know, a, a significant income. So, um, and just that I think that there is so much value in having these conversations about it because um, it, you know, it gives the, 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 the brands that like are looking to get their message out there by working with us are, have a level of expertise in communication that I think sometimes are us as creators lack because we're not talking about it. Right. So if you have other people that are in the same genre as you creating the same type of content as you like reach out to them and just try to get on the same page about like, how are you approaching this? Um, if you're comfortable talking about rates, it's great to do that with other people that are kind of in the same league as you, because it's just, it, it's hard to know where to start, right? Like, it, and it's also a reason that it's hard to give out generic advice. Cause you know, what we would say our rates are, it will not make sense for 99% of people listening because they're in a different country in a different market. There are different listenerships, followers, different niche of category. I mean, there's so many variables to it. So the specific numbers of somebody you might follow on YouTube may not matter. It's much more about, you know, see where you sit and find like minded or, or similar people and communicate with them because it's really going to help you out. Um, so I don't know, that's, that's where I started, but wh where would you start thinking about this? Let's say somebody's already creating some kind of content. I think for the purposes of this, we'll kind of focus on YouTube, but also branch off a little bit to Instagram and I don't know how much TikTok you do. Um, but you know, we're, if, if we're already creating content that we know is good, we've got, uh, a few people, maybe let's, let's say maybe a few thousand just to set like a benchmark of like, you're not a total beginner. Um, you've established that people are willing to follow you for your content. How do you start moving this into a place where there's some money to be made? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's interesting because in the world of, uh, YouTube, it's, it's very, it has combination of like freelance video, but also running an advertising agency where, or like a, almost a TV agency where you're selling slots within your videos and also specific episodes. And, uh, it, there's always that combination of business and creative. Uh, and like I've always said, my creative aspect is maybe like 30 to 40% and my business aspect is probably closer to 60 to 70. Whereas I watch like channels like yourself where I feel like the video quality, production, content and all that is significantly better. And part of the perspective that we bring on like the, the whole business side of things in this course is that I'm very vocal of the fact that we know that our content and our quality is not like the top notch of the industry. It might be good enough 
enough and the volume might be good enough, but it's all about finding what works for your channel, what appeals to your skills and specifically what you like doing the most. Well, um, I, I also got to stop you there. You're always very humble about your production quality, but I, I mean, I think your videos look awesome. And, and especially, I think a lot of people would be listening that would look at your videos and be like, well, I'm not doing it at Justin's level. Like, should I, and he's being humble about it. So should I be ashamed of my iPhone recording, you know, like, um, uh, j j just like for anybody that's like self-conscious about the quality thing, quality can mean a lot of things. Sometimes it doesn't always mean uh, pure technical quality. Sometimes the focus really can be on content. I talk about like yeah. photography and filmmaking, so I kind of need to deliver on, on that angle. But in a lot of niches, it it's not as important as, as maybe for the stuff that we do. And like the niche is another part that I feel like is equally as important and what we talk a lot about in the course as well. It's like, you might have a few different interests, but when it comes to doing YouTube, the niche that you pick can ultimately really change. Like there's there's no way around it. The niche will a lot of times dictate where your channel, your business and all that is going to go because some industries are clearly far more lucrative than others and other industries might be very, I guess, content intensive. But for example, if you're very knowledgeable about a topic and there's a gap in that niche, then that can also be a very good gateway opportunity. And so I think what people need to know is that it is important to niche down and narrow down in order to know what works for you and the type of content that you're delivering. But at the same time, you can't be afraid of branching out of your niche a little bit. So for example, in my case, it was a tech channel for like almost a decade, but when I started getting interested in the whole real estate, home and interior stuff, I kind of realized that maybe tech is not exactly my strength, but people who watch the channel can tell that real estate, interior design and desk setups are like my passion at the moment. And as a result, the content actually performed a lot better as we continue to broaden our niche. And so I'd say the, life, like, the lifespan of like a channel throughout like a 10 year period might have three different periods where you are like in a niche you end up broadening for a few years, but then you narrow it back down and then you have new interests and broaden them again and then back down. And so like maybe right now you could say like a niche that we're tapping a little bit into is like Formula One. Uh, we did a video of a simulator the other week. It gets like 380,000 views. I haven't had a phone video do 380,000 views in like three to four years. And so because I'm in a Formula One now and it seems like the world is very interested in that, I still try to bring it back to like consumer technology and where it can tie in, whether it's like sponsors that are in the sport, maybe some innovation aspects of it, um, while also trying to cover a hot topic at the moment. So I think people have to be willing to narrow down, but at the same time, don't feel like you're limited by the niche that you chose in the beginning. Uh, going back to your question about like the channel size and when to monetize it, um, Another very important aspect is kind of deciding when to go full time on YouTube. Uh, in the beginning, a lot of people do YouTube as a hobby or as a side thing, maybe on weekends, after school, after work. And by, by sacrificing that amount of time to work on something, it's definitely a sign that it is important to you, you enjoy doing it. And so the longer you can continue to do it on the side and the more sacrifices that you give up to be able to sustain that, I think it prepares an individual to want to go full time if that is a direction that you choose. Um, when it comes to doing brand deals and building it into a business, it is also a very subjective area. In some industries, you might need hundreds of thousands of subscribers or followers before you're able to become profitable. Whereas in some niches, 10,000 followers, you might be the only one in that industry. And you, as a result of that, you get all the brand deals and business from that just because you're the only one in that niche. And so, um, I mean, nowadays we're seeing channels being very profitable, specifically in the tech industry with just 20 to 30,000 subscribers. Um, people are making more money from YouTube than freelance. Whereas in my case, um, because it was like 2015, I didn't start doing brand deals until like 100,000 subscribers, which I feel like was a good thing because I definitely jumped into it a little bit too hard at 100,000 subscribers where it did diminish my growth. And if it happened any earlier, who knows, I might not even be making YouTube videos today still. Well, yeah, and just some examples of how niche it can be. I mean, I've seen successful channels that are built all about iPhone cases. Like that's, yeah. that's the topic. Keyboards are a big it does niche well. now. Yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, I, you know, the way I would describe mine is also that, uh, since I end up covering a little bit more of the pro production gear. So obviously I have mainstream tech sometimes, yeah. but it goes all the way up to like, look, people that are making a living doing commercial photo and video production. It, 
definitely has connected me with some sponsors that are looking to target that specific market that they know has money to spend. Like if you run this kind of business, you have, I mean, I'm sure you can relate. You have a lot higher expenses, uh, updating yeah. your gear every year and just keeping everything running. So you're willing to spend more money. And if you're watching videos like this, then you're more likely to be in the market for whatever the sponsor wants to advertise. So, um, I think as people consider their niche, I mean, so I guess in our example here, we suggested somebody's already maybe got a niche, but if you haven't quite locked into one yet, I, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't choose anything purely based off of profit. Cause you're, yeah. you're probably going to struggle if you don't actually love it. Like you, you do have to both like know about the topic or at least be like really passionate about and, and, and planning to learn about it. Maybe you're sharing your learning experience, but Absolutely. if you don't care, I mean, it's, it's totally going to flop. Um, so <laughs> yeah, first of all, care about it, feel like you could sustain conversations about it for years into the future, hopefully. Um, and, and then, yeah, hopefully you give some consideration to like, whether there is a way to approach it in a somewhat of a commercial way. And uh, another example, actually a, a counter example of something I know makes less money. Um, Ali Abdal has talked to, I think on this show, when he was on, he was talking about that. Uh, an example of what makes quite a bit less for him is like he also does book reviews because he reads a lot and he finds it really yeah. interesting. It's important to him. But he's like the the monetization on the book content is minimal. Like there just there isn't a lot of spend out there. People don't want to sponsor book videos. Um, meanwhile, his business strategy stuff, which is what we're doing right now, uh, you know that the 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 profit ratio off that the margins are just much much higher because businesses that whether they're buying a direct ad within the video or they are buying YouTube's um, pre-roll ads and stuff like that, they're willing to spend more on either one. Yeah, like the personal finance industry, for example, comparative to other industries, the CPM is very different, but there are also people who create content that may not be monetizable on the YouTube side of things for a number of reasons, um, but they sell a lot of merch. And so it, it really comes down to, I guess, a specific area. Tech has always been one, as we all know, that has had like a very medium to low level of CPM comparative to some of the other industries out there. But when it comes to sponsorships, for the number of subscribers that people in tech have relative to the kind of deals that like you and I are signing in the tech industry, it is significantly larger than in some spaces where channels have millions and millions of subscribers. Um, there are also some spaces that heavily rely on affiliate revenue, for example. Uh, personal finance and courses, aside from AdSense, also rely heavily on affiliates off of um, software-based products and maybe do significantly less sponsorships. So I think there is a lot of, I guess, overlap between different industries and especially in product-based industries. But at the same time, finding a number, similar to finding a niche, having many revenue streams and exploring each one before narrowing down to a few very important ones specific to your niche is the key to run, I guess, a successful business that still anchors very heavily off of one or two streams uh, long term. Yeah. Well, let's make sure to go through all of those different revenue streams too, because yep. obviously it can be broken down many ways. But first, let's also make sure to to cover the differences between different platforms as well. Because just like we're saying, different niches will have different yeah. profitability or, you know, the same number of followers can make you more or less money in different niches. The same thing goes for the platform that you want. Um, I really like YouTube for this. And um, it's honestly, it's part of why I'm not heavily investing in TikTok in the way that I should. I mean, uh, you know, all of the, the marketing parts of me are like, I need to, I need to put yeah. way more effort and time into TikTok because th there's so much growth potential there. But at the same time, this, if you have equivalent followers on YouTube versus TikTok, you're going to make a heck of a lot more money on YouTube. It's, um, Absolutely. There, there's, there's one thing that's really frustrating with both TikTok and Instagram in how, uh, and is Instagram the same in how they pay out their, uh, like revenue, their ad share revenue of like, okay, we're selling ads on your content. So we'll give you a little bit of money for it. They have a fixed pool of money that is determined each year and it doesn't change no matter how much they grow in the year, no matter how much money they make, they're only giving out the, I don't know, it's 200 million or whatever the numbers were. Whereas on YouTube, it's, it's exactly like, this is how many ads ran. So that's how much money you make. And you're making a pretty good percentage off of every single ad that Runs. In Canada, we can. I don't even know if we can take advantage of the, some of these uh, some of yeah. these benefits. So I haven't. It's. I, um, I mean, I think those industries as well are also very ad and sponsorship focused. Uh, but I think it's interesting that you mentioned. Yeah, the in, in terms of TikTok, I think some of the biggest TikTokers have always said 
YouTube is the most powerful platform overall. And the way you become profitable from TikTok is to convert those followers either over to Instagram or over to YouTube. <laughs> and But what I've yeah, also noticed right. is that it's very like tough to, as someone who's wired to create YouTube content, to create TikTok content um, versus someone who comes from like TikTok and Vine over to YouTube has always done extremely well because they're very good at engaging people at a very high ratio within a short period of time. So like David Dobrik's an example of someone who came from seven second videos and has done very well with four minute videos. Whereas someone who's like used to making 20 to 30 minute videos really struggles to engage an audience in just 30 seconds. Cause in a YouTube video, I'm still like not even done the intro yet. So I found TikTok to be the hardest platform to try to build and transition to. It seems like the most low effort stuff seems to do well. But I have found Instagram actually to be a huge area of potential. And in some cases, Instagram reels and Instagram posts are actually paying more than 30 and 60 second integrations on YouTube. Um, and the first few times you kind of are like, okay, this is like a one-off deal. It's not gonna be anything special and it's not gonna happen that often. But especially in like the last month or so, we're seeing like five, six deals all coming in at extremely high rates considering the level of production that's needed to go into the content on Instagram. And so even though I am trying to keep up with TikTok, for example, I'm still seeing a lot more potential in, in Instagram as a whole and as a monetizable platform from a sponsorship standpoint. Well, and also there's also an element of like how how do the ads fit into your mental model of like what a, what a sponsorship should feel like? Because so far we're, we're purely talking about it from like a, you know, I want to make money type perspective, yeah. right? Like this is like the whole goal here is to, to increase your revenue. And obviously it's, it's about a balance of making content that you like and that you know the audience is going to like. So I'll say for me, I've always had an easier time with uh, both the podcast model. Actually, the podcast sponsorships are the most um, like straightforward to me. And then YouTube after that. And the, the reason is it's like, look, here's the content. You you know what you're going to get. It's not going to change regardless of the sponsor. And in the middle, it's like this, this podcast is brought to you by, and then, you know, you get the sponsor message. Yeah. Um, and it's like, it's very, it's the separation is kind of clear. Like, you know, what's content, you know, it's yeah. not. And then it's harder to strike that balance on platforms where the it's all the whole like the content is the the sponsorship right so i've i've found it harder to strike that balance and i know some people find it relatively easy so um part of the the background for me is that anya and i were doing a lot more instagram business before i was doing youtube so she yeah. was more used to it and in the fashion world it's a little more straightforward because it's like the outfit that you're wearing in the photo is the sponsor so it all it's very it's like simple to organize in that way um whereas for tech i just have I don't know. I've had a harder time like doing it as natively as I, as I do in uh, podcasts and um, in videos. I don't know. How do you balance those things? Yeah, I think, in, I mean, tech specifically is a challenge. In fashion, it's very subjective. It's like, well, like one person's going to like the outfit, the other person's going to hate it. And like anybody, anybody can have their own opinion towards it. Whereas in tech, there are subjectively products that are good and products that are not as good and, and brands that are well known and not as well known. So I think the constant battle between finding that balance is always very hard. Some creators are easier to work with for brands than others. And so from a business interest, it's like, well, I don't want to be extremely difficult when it comes to concepts. But I also think at the same time, the biggest difference that I've noticed from like 2015 to now is that brands are having a better understanding of what content is effective for their campaign. And the simple answer to that is letting the creator do their thing. Um, letting them decide what is the best way to integrate this product, not having too much control over the content because the campaigns that we put the most effort into are the ones that were given the most flexibility and the least instruction. Whereas whenever there's a whole set of instructions, we'll go back to the most default, easy and generic way of delivering the campaign. But on the topic of like striking a balance, it is very, very hard. I mean, with integrations on YouTube, uh, especially in the tech industry, a lot of times it does come across as like a podcast ad where there is like a very distinct separation of what is sponsored, but also there are like slot based episodes where they, yeah, they can be very profitable because there are multiple slots within the video and you're talking about a variety of products one by one, but then you have like a sponsored product that is kind of slipped in there right in the middle. Um, I think having a very clear distinction of what is sponsored and what is not is very important, but there is still a bit of a sensitive topic towards like dedicated videos um, and the full video being sponsored, which seems to be something that has been like 
in the rise in the last year, um, not only from like companies having budgets to support them, but also just companies wanting to opt for that model. Um, and I mean, there's good and bad to it. The good thing is that like from a revenue standpoint, it is significantly larger and you're able to invest in much more resource, for example. But the good news is that a lot of good products nowadays that we would personally buy and want to review are part of these campaigns. Um, and so, for example, Sony has really stepped into the whole influencer space and doing a lot of sponsored videos where in the past they were relatively reserved towards this type of medium, similar to Apple. Um, and whenever a product comes out, they have a sponsored campaign. But like Sony, we know, is a good product. And throughout all the categories, they have been on like the cutting edge of that with their technology, their optimization, their experience. And, and so like it is nice to have paid campaigns where it's a product that I would personally buy and would have probably wanted to review on my own. Well, let's just make sure that we spell that out for anybody that's getting started with this and hasn't gone through any ever negotiating or brand deals. If somebody's approaching you to talk about a product, if it's a dedicated YouTube video, you've got to be charging at least three to five times as much. I mean, like multiples more, but, um, you know, they're buying a really large slot of time and attention. Um, so, uh, you know, that's another thing to think about, like when you're watching your favorite creator's channel and when you see a dedicated video, remember that that's a lot of how they're running their channel is like, like it really helps support the, the creator it's to huge, yeah. have those dedicated videos. Um, you know, it can, it can allow us to do more open-ended videos without sponsors as well, where it's like, you know, we, we have a little like more freedom in between them. So I don't know. I, I always feel like there's sometimes there's a bit of a push and pull from the audience of like yeah. um, being, you know, like they don't always want to see all these ads, but they're also are what are allowing us to create this content. Um, Absolutely. and then maybe another, another second of just like kind of that clarity of like, if you're, if you're still figuring this out, um, it, it in, in the olden days, if you were working at, let's say Macworld magazine, a lot of the people there would have gone to like journalism school. And in that they would have yeah. learned the basics of like journalism ethics and like the balance of, of how you kind of cover things and separate that from sponsorships. And that doesn't really exist anymore. So, um, a few people have done videos about this, uh, and, and I haven't, um, I think I've only really ever touched it on the podcast or sometimes I'll touch on it in the video, but, um, it's good to like watch what some other people have talked about. Um, you know, Marquez did a video all about like, here's when I'm getting paid. Here's the things that yeah. I'll take money for and what I don't snazzy did a video, a few people did, Oh, uh, Gerald Undone did one. Um, and I, I think all the ones that I'm naming, I think they all covered it pretty well. Like they did a smart job of evaluating, like, you, you will always know the separation between like from giving my opinion and when I'm, I'm being paid to tell you about this product and I'll always let you know what that difference is because there's always this suspicion. I mean, like the best example is phone reviews that they're like, this review is a plant from Apple. Like how much did Apple pay you to say you like this or how much did Samsung yeah. pay you to say you like this? It's like the reviews are never sponsored. Like the reviews are always reviews. And if it's sponsored... Yeah. It's like, it's showcasing the product. It's showing off a feature. It's just like, that's how I often frame it. And maybe an easy way for some other people to kind of frame that difference is like, if you're being paid to do it, I'll just, here it is, but yeah. uh, I'm not going to specifically review it. Yeah. And I think like that's the delivery of a lot of dedicated videos nowadays, at least in our approach. Uh, it's, you, you talk about the product and its features, but you don't definitively evaluate it from like an objective perspective. Uh, you, you're still allowed to list out flaws. And I think a lot of these brands now are like, uh, the way we explain it to the brand is like, by listing the pros and the cons, you're gonna have a better chance of selling your product if you allow the consumer to make an evaluative decision on their own. And yeah. if you're confident about your product and you, you think or know it's the best in the industry, by allowing us to openly talk about it exactly the way that we want without any influence, is going to lead to the best campaign overall and also trust and, towards our channel and your brand. Yeah, well, viewers aren't dumb. They they know from watching everybody else's videos what the problems with the product are. They know that no product's perfect. So yeah, I think it helps them to see that you're aware of those issues as well. Yeah, for sure. It's um, I mean, it's always an interesting thing that's going to like continue to develop. I know journalism as well. That is a very ad-based industry. And all of the, especially in America, you look at all the different large um, news networks, all like, each one does have their bias towards certain things, whether it's through financial interests. And and so I think with the YouTube side of things, uh, everybody has their own set of 
I guess, ethics that they would like to apply. Some people don't even take free flights to go on trips. They pay for all of their individual. They don't want any form of compensation, whether it is gifted monetarily, um, and others are okay with doing that, but they make it very transparent to their audience and how the money is always being reinvested into creating better content. Um, in our channel, I mean, it's no secret that we do do a lot of ads. Uh, we're a very advertisable channel um, that does work with a lot of different brands, and we are very transparent with it, both in the channel and also in our business course in hopes of educating people who are interested in going with that route. But at the same time, I also invest my entire life and the revenue back into some way that can tie into the channel, whether it's the home series, um, the crazy travel series. I mean, flying a team of three around um, to certain trips where we're just kind of creating more experimental content is not exactly cheap. And as a result of feeling like we have infinite resources, we do feel like it is a worth a trade off in the long run. But there are also people who are going to have different opinions towards, I guess, how we run the YouTube channel and how we work with sponsors. Well, and now I think it'd be a good time to talk about some of these different ways of making money too, like, cause it's, it's not all straightforward sponsor stuff. There's a ton of different ways. Yeah. Um, and one, one more note on what you were just saying as well. I think it can be easy for people to forget or not notice how expensive it can be to run a, a YouTube channel, especially something that's like tech-based where every product we're reviewing, not every single one, a lot of them are th thousands of dollars. <laughs> I mean, like just yeah. to, you know, to break, to break even on a video, like there's gotta be money coming in from somewhere. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's not, it's, it's, there's, yeah, there's upfront costs that are definitely involved. So, um, and especially when you're first that, getting started get to it. get your foot in the door, it's really tough yeah. because like you gotta, people are getting products early. And so the only way to be able to kind of get your foot in the door with some of these big companies is to go ahead and buy the product and review it in a way that is so extraordinary and well-performing that they're going to catch wave of your content. And yeah. like, I remember like when I first, uh, did some smartphone reviews, I could only afford one phone a year. And so I emptied out my bank account, like $800 to buy the Samsung galaxy. And that was a phone where like, when it arrived, I was like, I have to figure out a way to get this money back. And I was making like $10 on AdSense at the time. And so when it came, I filmed 25 videos because I figured this channel has a, thou <laughs> like a couple thousand subscribers. There's no way one video is going to be enough. And so why don't we cover like all like 20 topics, like the most detailed, useless topics. Maybe we're the only ones that created videos on some of these features. But if we cover it in 20 different ways, hopefully one of these videos or combined is going to lead to something. And as a result, it ended up hitting three and a half million views on one, a million on others, a couple hundred thousand here and there. And from the AdSense money alone, I think I must have made like $15,000. And that was after my agency uh, that I signed with when I was a kid uh, took 40% out of that. And that is like, when you're in like high school, that's a significant amount of money oh, yeah, to just like fall on your lap. And I ended up spending all of it back on camera equipment because I liked making YouTube videos. But that's just an example of like, I guess taking a big risk at the time that didn't seem like a smart decision, but coming up with a strategy that ended up paying off in an industry that is relatively expensive to be able to operate in and reinvesting that back into it. And then you kind of get that addiction. Like, well, when's the next phone coming out? I want to do the mm -hmm. exact same thing again. I'm going to continue to do this. And if I do this 10 times, I'm going to be able to build my channel size and my resources and capital by 10 times. And maybe one day it could be a full-time job. And so, I mean, at the time there was a lot of uncertainty, like 2015, not that many people were doing YouTube for a living. Whereas nowadays there are people who started YouTube channels less than a year ago and are able to make like hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in a space effectively if uh, they're able to find some traction there. Yeah, it's really not too, anybody that feels like, oh, it's too late, it's 2022 and everything's already, all the videos are already being made. It 100% isn't like every year is the right time to get started if you haven't already. Um, and yeah, my Absolutely. growth story is sort of similar of like, uh, it was, you know, buying the iPhone eight for myself and doing that review. And I, at the time it was a bit of a bit of a different strategy because I, instead of doing a whole bunch of videos, I like doubled down on, um, the amount of, of quality content. Like I, I traveled a lot for it. I was in a lot of different locations and I was shooting like all this kind of vlog style review that at the time wasn't happening as much. So it, it stood out in the moment because less people were putting a lot of effort into one uh, tech review. And I think now there's, yeah. since so many people, like you say, are making money at it, more people can afford to really put a lot of work into it. So the, you've, you're always got to find like, what is the opening now? What's being underserved? Um, and, and what can I speak to well and, and find that area to get into because it's shifting and what worked when we got started isn't necessarily going to work today, but 
the openings are still there. Um, let's break down a little bit of the, those different revenue streams and a yep. bit of like how you see them. Like what's, what's the biggest, what's worth focusing on? Uh, you know, um, I don't know. Start, start, start yeah, I think it, uh, it is very industry specific and it also comes in waves. And so, I mean, the way that I started uh, making money on YouTube was back when AdSense was only like a penny. I'd get like 10 views a video. And so as you build a couple thousand subscribers and brands are willing to send you products, the most logical thing to me was I'm going to get as much free stuff as possible and I'm going to sell them. And so you make $20 here and there, like, like you end up like piling together, there's a few hundred dollars. And when you're in middle school, that's enough to kind of be like, okay, well, I guess I can buy next year's iPod when it comes out, or I'll use all this money to buy one product that I think will be popular or something that I personally want. In the beginning, it's a lot of just fueling your own passion. Um, so being someone who is relatively new to technology and wasn't really interested in technology growing up, tech was like my newfound passion. And so whether this money was being spent on products to review on the channel or for myself, it was genuinely something that I would have wanted to spend my money in at the time. And so in the beginning, it's just selling stuff. You scrape by, you sell a few things here and there. Eventually AdSense, as you start to get a few videos that bring some traction and build up the channel in terms of the number of videos, that's also a good passive stream. But personally, I've never really focused on AdSense. I've always looked at it as like, I mean, it's great when AdSense is good. Um, it's a passive stream. And chances are, if you have more views and you're able to increase your AdSense revenue, it's going to increase the amount of money that you make on your passive, on your active streams as well, which is like brand deals and active sponsorships as a result of that. And so I always look at active revenue as stuff that you can control and decide where you want to focus on. And so selling products, brand deals are definitely like the largest in like our specific scenario of the tech industry. And I mean, you can always find ways to generate revenue within your industry. Uh, for a little bit, I would always buy a bulk of free products off of other YouTube channels. So um, maybe like there's a guy reviewing like 100 cases a year and he has a family, doesn't have time to sell all that stuff and probably makes money off of other areas where it just isn't worth his time. And so I'd say like, I'll give you 300 bucks, send that 50 pounds of stuff to my house. I'll sort through it myself. I'll individually take photos of the, each listing and I'll sell them on eBay and ship them out individually. And as a result, I was maybe able to make like two, three, four thousand dollars off of a $300 box, but it was very labor intensive. Um, but also finding things to do in the beginning that can tie into skills that apply to the large picture of the business is also very important. So by dealing with people on Craigslist, on eBay, customer service, negotiating prices, um, meeting like shipping deadlines, those are all things that we still use in the video industry. Uh, dealing with all the communications with companies, uh, negotiating brand deals, meeting deadlines, and ensuring the customer is happy is still fundamentally skills that I learned even before I started YouTube while I was trying to save up for the iPod. So um, those are like two revenue streams. The other one is also affiliates by having links and videos. Those are very important. And especially if you're buying the products and giving a very, I guess, generalized and like analytical approach, that is a great way to generate affiliate revenue because creators and reviewers like that are the ones that typically can influence buying decisions at a very genuine level. Uh, back in the day, I only had one new tech product a year. So all of my videos would be about the iPod Touch. And so I became like, I guess, a trusted area for the iPod Touch being an actual user. And like, I mean, nowadays there's hundreds of things that show up at the office. So the amount of attention that goes towards each product and interest towards each product is inevitably going to be like a little bit less than, than back in the day. So affiliates are another huge one. Um, in the photo industry, presets, courses, are also a really, really good passive stream. Uh, people can create the product once and sell it for many years and be able to seamlessly integrate it into their YouTube videos um, for people to buy with just the click of a button. And if you wanna have like an unsponsored video, you can still have your own presets in there because it's a product that you have yourself. Uh, in other spaces, merch is also a really big one. And I mean, I've never really liked the merch space and, um, and in tech specifically, it may not be as lucrative as in other spaces, but it's another way to make money uh, through finding a product in your space. Uh, another one is also um, brand consulting. A lot of say, companies wearing, are looking- I'm wearing two merch shirts right now, one under the other. I got MKBHD <laughs> and I got a Halide hoodie over top. I mean, if you're so MKBHD, works. yeah. MKBHD works, yeah. yeah. It's, well, um, I, I, also, I also just want to throw in there that a lot of this depends on scale too, because yeah. as I come across advice about how to charge and what to charge and all this stuff, sometimes 
it can be really targeted at, at like whatever level the person that you're watching is is currently at. Yeah. Um, so, for example, you know, there's a lot of interviews with Ian from SeatGeek who would sponsor the David Dobrik yeah. videos, and he would talk about sponsorships and stuff. And um, those conversations assume a certain level of following already. And once you yeah. have a certain level of numbers, like, I don't know, let's say you pass a million subscribers or whatever, or you can regularly hit a few th hundred thousand views, every, all of these avenues start to open up to you and you just you're just choosing which way you want to make money but when you're 100%. earlier on when you're you know like uh, i don't know where i am which is still way under a million and um you're, you're you're there's less of a super high guarantee of each video um the paths can be differing right so an example for myself is that affiliate revenue has just never really kicked in for me in a way that is interesting um, like Same it just here. hasn't really added up to a lot. Um, you know, Lutz have done like, well, like it's a, it's a real paycheck at the end of the year, but it couldn't be a job. The only thing that could, could be a full-time job is like, like you're saying, like direct sponsorships. This video is brought to you by, um, those types of sponsorships are what can sustain the channel. Everything else is basically gravy for my channel, but I know others the product is the whole revenue stream or affiliates is the whole thing. So it, it absolutely depends on, well, many, many factors, but, but one thing that always comes down to as well is like, if you can get the numbers up, then you start to just have more flexibility and you can, you, you, you can, th 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 yeah, making money from all of them at the same time becomes a little more possible. So I think on the topic of revenue streams, I think it's very important to know that quality should always be prioritized over quantity, but at the same time, you still want to be able to experiment with all these different streams. And uh, when I look at like the YouTube channel, when it was first started, and especially in the first few years, while there wasn't a very big following, we probably had 10 different revenue streams and each one contributed 10% or less to the overall revenue. Uh, but then when we look at it today, we've probably narrowed down to like three or four of them and there's one or two that are like 97% of the business. And so on the topic of revenue streams, it's just like finding a niche where in the beginning you try a bit of everything, you figure out which one works, you start to narrow down on a few of them and see which one has like potential to scale and makes the most sense and leads to the overall growth of your company and your channel. But then eventually you still need to kind of try to slim down and figure out where it's worth prioritizing your time. So in our case right now, sponsorships are 90 to 95% of the revenue. AdSense is kind of automated and similar to affiliates. It's not something that we pay attention to too much. The course is one where like, yeah, maybe it's not a significant amount of money yet, but we don't have to do anything once it's been created. And it's the same with like the Airbnb business. Like the Airbnb business might generate like 25,000 a year after all the mortgage has been paid, which is pretty good considering nothing has to be done, but it won't change the business, but it'd be nice to have more of those because once you have three or four, then it starts to become an area where like that alone can hire additional talent or allow you to upgrade your equipment a lot more frequently. Um, the clothing company is an example of a revenue stream that we don't focus on because it can be very time consuming, but at the same time, the amount of revenue and profits that it generates always has to go back into the company. Whereas passive income streams such as like AdSense or like course revenue can be directly spent back into the core business because there are not any costs associated with selling that product. I think that hits another important point of some amount of diversification of um, what, like what are your, what are the weak points in your chain? Where are you, possibly going to end up losing money in the future if things change that are outside of your control and what can kick in as a backup. Because if you've diversified, but every different path all leads back to YouTube, and you just, yeah. I'll take this as my excuse to complain about uh, the potential of B C B uh, Bill C11 in Canada, which I, I worry might change the distribution of YouTube videos and maybe yeah. could lead to them being seen a little less. And if that were to be the case, I wouldn't want my whole business to fail because of YouTube changing the algorithm to appease the Canadian government. I want to still have some resiliency there. So the way we think about that is we've always maintained our photo and video clients. So we're still doing client production yeah. work on the side. And if YouTube goes away tomorrow, th I mean, it would hurt, but we would have, a, a, we, it's like, okay, we know what we're going to focus on. So similarly as well, it's good reasons to always both be spread across different platforms so that your audience can follow you from one to the other, or if one slows down, you can redirect them. And then also to have something that is basically independent of social media. Um, sometimes I think about this 
what we're doing as really being in the entertainment industry to some extent. And if you think about your favorite actors and the careers that we've watched them go over, I, I mean, actually, I was watching Top Gun last night and thinking about like, it's super weird that around 2007 or so, Tom Cruise, who is like the only A-list celebrity left at this point, it feels like, kind of had his career almost go away. Like he really uh, kind of, kind of like went down the, uh, a little bit of a rabbit hole that felt like, oh, are we going to hear from him again? And it's so much is based on like how people feel like is, is he in the public mind right now? And even though he's a huge star, he doesn't get to control that. And I think we have some of that lack of control too, where it's like, you know, at any point I could, people could stop liking glasses and beards and all of a sudden I'm uh, out of a YouTube job. And so um, just as, <laughs> as you expand this, think about ways that you can leverage it to build totally separate businesses. And clearly you're doing that with real estate as well. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's a very interesting topic. And I feel like in the space of YouTube, social media, and especially in like creative industries, you always feel like you're fighting to survive. You're always questioning yourself. Like, am I good enough in the space? Uh, is this all a fluke? Did I get too lucky? And especially with YouTube, it's always like that. You upload one bad video and you're, and the last 10 years of work is just like, well, clearly I still we haven't figured do, this thing out because like, we should do mental health episode well. too. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, it's a constant battle of like questioning yourself and especially like even like in the past few years, for example, um, the business has done very well and it's continued to grow. But then you have like two weeks where you don't get a single inquiry and you're like, well, this is the time like we're going down the it's train. Over. Finally. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like it's I had a great run at it. It's been 10 years. And even if like I didn't think I'd even do this for 10 years. So even if it does fail, it's not that bad. But like, come on, like, is this is this it? Um, it's almost like athletes too, like constantly questioning themselves. But at the the end of the day I feel like if you've been doing uh, something for a while and you're very attentive of the skills that you're bringing up uh, you can really apply this and adapt it to anything I mean anyone who is who is uh, been in an industry for a long time can try to find transferable skills within that uh, I think you and I for example if YouTube went away would be totally fine you're probably better set up for it because you you're, you like doing like photo and video work commercially whereas I think the first thing I would do is sell all my cameras and just go buy more real <laughs> estate and continue to run like Airbnbs and do, right. I'd probably do like business consulting, for example, where we talk about sure you how fine. companies can do marketing and stuff like that. But I think we realize uh, there are a lot of areas that can be transferred, but right now we are living in an era of influencer marketing where we're definitely, I guess, very getting used to very good budgets for the amount of work that goes into content. Yeah. Like a video that can be filmed a day can can pay essentially like a years of what the average person makes as a salary. And that's just very, very crazy to me that on the internet that has that ability. Um, and Depending so what level it's, you're it's at, good, by but, the way. For anybody, for anybody that's just getting started, <laughs> you have to get to that point first. It's not a, not a yeah, sure thing. It takes 10 years to build. It can take 10 yeah. years to build. But at the same time, um, I think being smart with investments and, and finding streams outside of YouTube is very important. But I also heavily believe in, like in this area, era where influencer marketing is so big, like why don't you tap into it and take advantage of every bit of it because it might not be around forever, even if it right. seems like it will be. Yeah, but I think there's even more transferable skills as well. It's both, um, yeah. I mean, sure, photo and video production is one of the skills required, but the, the more important ones to me are the ability to communicate succinctly. Like, it's even part of the reason I like to podcast is it makes me practice speaking and long stretches and being clear Absolutely. about my thoughts. Um, and, you know, both of us, after all this time, um, sitting in front of cameras, we're more comfortable hearing our voices recorded. We're more confident and uh, f sounding, we're, we're able to come across confident in ideas that we believe in that, um, that can be really challenging if all you're ever doing is standing up in one or two meetings a week or a month. Um, you know, we get a lot of practice at that every time we turn on the camera. And I, I think even if social media disappears tomorrow, these are yeah. very useful skills in a digital society now. So, um, yeah, no, I, I I've, always, I've appreciated the things I've gotten better, um, as I do, well, I'm making it sound like I got better. I don't know if I really did, but I, you know, I'm working on I, it. <laughs> I feel like I got worse, but people who look at old videos would tell us that we got yeah, a lot yeah. better. I'm like, I'm like, I mean, I back then I used videos. to research videos for weeks at a time. Like I, in class, I had so much time just to go on my laptop and look at all these notes and stuff. Whereas now I'm like, I'm looking at these notes like 30 seconds before we're about to film or even during filming, but maybe I'm just better at consuming information in a lot quicker time and synthesizing it than before. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I feel like um, in, in, the whole, in the whole creator space, uh, what people don't realize is that 
you're running every aspect of the small business uh, at some point of it. Uh, when you first start, you're doing like accounting, you learn to do taxes for the first time because you weren't expecting to make money in a given year. You learn to sell stuff, um, you film, you edit, you upload, you communicate with your audience. There are so many like different moving parts that when you really break it down, these are individual skills that in the real world, a lot of times are your full-time job. But instead through YouTube, you get a bit of a taste of every aspect of not only running a business, but also a media business but also working in an industry where you're completely on your own, you're living in your own head half the day. Um, occasionally you might have like a social event or, or like a company launch event where you get to meet other creatives, but other than that, you're, you're really living in your own head. Um, you grow your team and a lot of times there are struggles within that as well where some people might not be able to align um, or you're very protective of certain aspects of your business and it's very tough to give away. So. I think it almost feels like a video game sometimes, like you're living in a simulation, you're running your own little business uh, on like Monopoly or something like that. Um, so it's a lot of fun, but it can be it can be stressful and I will say like it's not exactly for everyone. I think there's a lot of people who would see the schedule and the amount of commitments and think it's absolutely crazy and unsustainable, but it's clearly fun because a lot of us yeah. enjoy doing it and want to continue Yeah, you don't it. rest much. Um, well, before I run out of time with you, I also just want to touch on if anybody's at the point of trying to figure out if they should be managing their own, the business on their channel, or if they should be working with an agent or agency or, um, you know, like w what should they be hiring out or letting people take a portion of their income to, to take care of? Uh, how do you make that decision? Both of us manage it ourselves. Um, so obviously we've come to the same conclusion. How do you think about that in terms of advice for other people? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a blend of both. In some industries, it makes a lot of sense just to focus on content and have an agent manage everything. But I think the big intention and the message that we're trying to send in the course is even if you plan to have an agent manage your brand deals, it's extremely important to be able to understand how the industry works, how the business side works on your own. Because um, otherwise you might get ripped off, you might not know other people's intentions. And with like the online course, for example, we're trying to enter the ad buying space and we don't really know what the information is being told to us, if that's true or if we're getting ripped off, they wanna sign us on a retainer, just because we have no previous experience. But in this scenario, it's because I don't have the time to do it. But I do feel like in the beginning, creators should definitely navigate their own brand deals for a little bit, see how it works, see the moving parts, kind of understand your own tendencies and what you prefer, things to look out for in the contract. Um, at the end of the day, you, you become like a mini legal expert. There are certain things in the contracts that you always have to look at, such as exclusivity, timeline, payment schedule, and all the other fine print that is extremely important that I feel like every creator at some point, whether you like the business side or not, has to learn it on their own. Um, but I, I do feel like it is also an area that can be easily outsourced and is important to outsource as long as you find an agent that is able to communicate the interests and is able to pitch your channel and your business as effectively as possible. Because a lot of the agents have a ton of different clients and instead of specifically pitching a certain video idea, a series, or your specific interest in that company and how you want to promote it, it might just be like a simple email with one line of how much um, budget and what you might want, but like a creator themselves who understands their business fully because they're the ones that created it might make like a pitch deck or go on a call and explain in detail that can really help sell the deal, but also help uh, train like business and communication skills. So. I think it depends. Uh, there are people who focus on creating and are very good at that and should stick to that. Um, whereas there are people who are very good at the business side that no agent is able to promote and kind of sell the brand as well as they're able to. And so um, I think just understanding your business is, is the key there. And then from there you can evaluate what you need and where you should hire out. Uh, when it comes to hiring your first employee or first two, it's probably the most difficult part of any YouTube channel or media company. Uh, hiring a creative sounds like the most logical step. Someone who can help film and edit for you to be able to, I guess, increase the scale of your production. But at the same time, I've learned the good and bad side of hiring a creative first. Um, and I ended up being able to build the business much more significantly after I hired a general manager who didn't have any experience in creative, but instead it was able to help me build the business aspects and the general operations before I was ready to hire another creative. Um, and so I find that by, by I guess, 
learning all the skills on your own and doing everything on your own at some point, it's going to be the most valuable in the long run. So um, I'm glad I didn't hand off the video editing and filming aspect too early because to be totally honest, I haven't really developed many new cinematography skills in the last two years just because we've been handing off all of our editing now. But at this stage of the business, that's what makes sense and that's the only way to continue being sustainable in terms of the workload. But if I hadn't have done everything on my own for the first six, seven or eight years, once again, the channel might not be where it is now because even though I'm very critical about my own video quality, I would still say there's still a decent eye for style and settings and color grading and all that stuff that, um, that I learned from before. Yeah. I, I mean, I can definitely see it in your work and I, I think there's a really common misconception that are with people expecting that the sign that they made it is that they'll be approached to be signed by an agent. Like that's the, that's making it is getting yeah. signed. And I just want to clarify that that is, just Don't not the it. case at all. Like, yeah, it's, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, the first uh, the first deal that you're probably offered, uh, I mean, probably is not the best one. I, I I would recommend people at least spend as long as you can managing it yourself, so that you understand it, so that when you eventually grow to the point that you can't handle the influx of emails, you're getting so many yeah. deals that you can't respond to them all, then maybe that's the time to consider uh, representation. But I mean, um, it sucks really to be on to calls be and emails you. all day. There's yeah, so much does. back and forth. It's uh, there's so many contracts, and it really, it really, I find that the most tiring part of the, of the business. But I also enjoy doing that the most, uh, putting deals together and all that. So, um, it's. It's one where, I mean, it's a constant battle. There's things that you like doing, there's things that you don't like doing. I used to love video editing, and when I first started, I loved filming, but then now I feel like there's so much pressure to filming, there's so many deadlines to meet, and editing goes into late nights, and like for, for 10 years, I worked like seven days a week and in the evenings, and now I still work in the evenings, but it's more so like stuff that I want to do versus like I have to edit this video right now. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it definitely goes in waves. Um, and every business is unique and of its own, depending on which niche you're in, what type of channel it is, what type of person you are, and what you enjoy doing. And so um, I think discovering that is why all of us are still very excited about the industry and our jobs, even after doing it for a very long time. Cool. Well, if anybody wants to check out Justin's course, the link will be in the show notes and in the description. Justin, what's the name of it again so people can Google it? It's uh, creatorcashflow.com. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks for talking to me about it. Thanks. Also, just like over the years, thanks for the help being, you know, open and having conversations with me about it because not everybody does, but I really think it helps out. It's very important. Yeah, it's for the, yeah. And in any freelance industry, not just create, we're talking about creators Absolutely. right now, but if you're a, a landscaper, whatever it is, like small businesses can really help each other out by having somewhat of a community. And also having that community and conversation prevents the clients from like driving prices too, too far down. Cause don't think they're Absolutely. not, you know, quoting us against each other and trying to get the lowest possible price they can. So, um, you know, For we sure. gotta have each other's backs too. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's great that the tech industry does have quite a good level of com um, of transparency, but there are definitely industries where people don't share things. Uh, people might use that information in negative ways, but I feel like from a big picture perspective, the betterment of the industry is when people communicate and kind of push it towards that direction that they want because it is very much like a brand versus creator type of space. Um, and as brands are getting a lot smarter with how they work with creators, it's it can lead to two things. It can lead to great deals for creators or it can lead to people getting taken advantage of. And so um, I love talking about the business side of things. Um, I also ask you a lot of questions about the creative side of things because I'm very stubborn with my workflow and I don't change it. But when I find something new, I really like to fully commit to that. So um, yeah, I appreciate the conversations that we have. And uh, I think the tech industry still has a lot of great things coming and especially with channels that cover a bit of lifestyle and in your case have photography niche but are able to bring that into technology these are the channels that are going to be continuing to lead the innovation moving forward and i think a lot of uh, the best technology creators are all based in canada and unique in their own ways yeah it's weird how that is i i i, I had a last thing i have a small theory on how that happened that i just kind of came up with when i was at wwdc i feel like it's because there are less obvious opportunities for creative stuff within Canada. Like there's less avenues yeah. to say, like move to LA or New York to move to a bigger city where there is established media. So anybody that wants to get into any kind of media production, it's you kind of look left, look right. And you're like, well, 
I guess I'm doing it myself because there's nothing else going on around here. So a lot of Canadians just get up. Victoria and, uh, and Calgary. Yeah, two, in, exactly. two interesting places where you got to find your own interests and, yeah, um, and aspects of creativity. But yeah, it'll be fun until, um, <laughs> until the bill wipes us out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. All right. Thanks again, Justin. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much.